Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to call the meeting to order. We have a full house tonight and lots of important things to get to. So, um, the first thing I'd like to do is ask um, if anybody has any questions about the minutes. And if not, I'd like a motion to approve. So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Great. My work here is done. <laughs> I'm happy to turn it over now for um, general updates from the designer. Okay, so I just have a, a short thing to update everybody on, which is the educational program and space summary. Um, since our last, I don't expect anybody to read this, and I intentionally. We're not sure. More are coming. Um, I intentionally did not bring copies because uh, throughout the process there'll be little tweaks in, in the course of the program. Nothing has changed substantively, um, but we did finish completed a round of uh, users with uh, meetings with user groups and teachers. And um, through that process, we uncovered a handful of things that had not been accounted for. So they, they all land within the special education category. It's a very modest increase, just under 400 square feet. Um, a handful of conference rooms, some offices. We actually found that we had, you know, some of this is really trying to form what's right for the future, for the future schools. So, for example, Therapeutic Learning Center, we had held two classrooms as a placeholder. The more we went through discussions, we found out it's really a K-2 program and one classroom was needed. Um, and that some work is also done, I believe, in the pre-K rooms. Um, so. We saved one classroom there, and then we found a, a list of small ads that we needed. So I don't think this will be a problem. The MSBA would expect, as we go through the process, that things will change. We'll just have to explain um, those modest adjustments. Um, we also, I also recognize that within the administration and guidance component, we were carrying, because it's an MSBA default, some guidance counselor's offices, and in fact, we don't need guidance counselors per se, um, but what that allowed us to do was to increase some of the office space um, that I think is, is um, well warranted because we're trying to create two administration areas, one for the pre-KK and one for the grade one to two. So we have been working with the NSBA allowance and cut some of those offices down in size. We now can restore them, so that's what I've done with that square footage. Uh, and that, obviously, whenever you change the program, for net square footage, it increases the bottom line, so we're talking about 600 square feet. This is really a blip. Um, so no big deal. But one of the things that will need to be done between now and, you know, I guess certainly between now and our next submission is that the educational program itself will need to be updated with comments from the MSBA from the last go-around. I think that's already been done. And, um, and then any of these adjustments, if they Warren, uh, an explanation of need for space, those will have to be uh, clarified. So it's not a major change, but it's something that we'll need to work on. And I raise this tonight because um, it's really up to, I guess, the educational leadership if these changes, modest changes in space summary and then updating the Ed program, warrants school committee to, to it. I, I would say that may be a formality, but that's really up to the district. So, not, nothing to decide tonight, but I um, just want to make it one point. And if we, re, if we update the ed, ed program, do we need to resubmit that to the MSBA? That, it, that will get submitted in the next okay. formal submission, which is the PSR, the Preferred okay. Schematic Report, which is scheduled for May 8th. So it is coming pretty soon. <clears throat> and certainly I can answer any questions along the way. So that's it for Space Summary and the program. I think that we also um, hand this over to Dawn to talk a little bit about Central Admin. We did take a quick look from our last meeting at um, what it might look like to locate the central offices with the combined school. Right. So I reached out to find out approximately the size of your current space. Sounded like it was just over 4,000, 4,200. Um, asked if that was adequate. Um, you said a small increase might be helpful, somewhere in the 
5,200, was that where you landed? I grossed it up to about 50, between 5,000 and 5,500, depending on the um, option that you look at. Laid it out in three different ways on the combined new at Parkview, just, just to keep things consistent and for sake of discussion. So, uh, option A looks at sort of a self-contained <coughs> space on the end of one of the educational wings uh, and then looked at pros and cons. Obviously here, the footprint increases by 5,500 uh, square feet. Um, I put as a neutral that all the options would include additional parking because as we evaluate these against each other, that's common amongst all of them. Recognizing it's sort of a negative on this site in general, but all three options would put it on this site and all three options would need the additional parking. Uh, and we could talk about that more. I didn't get it too much into detail on how it affects the site, just recognizing if it would or would not. And in the other cases you'll see we were able to fit it in the existing footprint that were proposed here. Um, and then all would add additional car traffic for the sake of the people that come to the central admin space. So again, that's on all, it's kind of a neutral factor on all of them. Here, it's a minimal impact to the education, meaning you don't, it could have its own entry, it could sort of serve as its own piece of the building and still be connected without having to enter into the existing school to get there. Uh, you could have a connection if you wanted it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And, and so then obviously it's able to operate independently um, with a separate entry. So there's a red arrow there for recognizing that it could be adjacent to the pre-K. And on the second floor, it's just shown for reference. It actually doesn't affect the second floor at all. Looking at it differently and trying to recognize that there are a lot of spaces fighting for the first floor footprint and that we're already on a tight site given the size of the school, we looked at how we could work it into the existing design and still have it, you know, sort of function independently. In this case, there would be no building footprint <coughs> increase. We took over the um, southernmost wing at four four classrooms that we ended up uh, bringing upstairs, so I circled them here. Uh, this does affect the clusters in the sense that it does negatively, in a sense, it breaks up that, that cluster that we overtook, if you will. Um, and in that sense, the clusters on the second floor get larger and these sort of run along the same spine. Uh, but again, you could have a separate entry from the drive, you know, parking's an issue in all of them, and we can talk about that. Uh, but this fifth classroom is OTPT, and that just is directly adjacent to the gym, so that could function off this main spine independently. So you could have a connection here off the school, but you could also have it operate independently. And then the third option we took a look at was putting it on the second floor, which again does not increase. Oh, look, I actually don't mind these. Just read below the pros and cons. Um, there's no building footprint increase on this one either, but what it does do is <coughs> impacts the education from the media center standpoint. What it did, if you don't remember, and this is the enlarged second floor, I'll go back and show you, the uh, media center was up in this area and it got moved to a more central location and then the central admin would need a dedicated stair as you came in <coughs> off the main entry you may or may not engage with the main administration or come directly upstairs to central admin. So it requires sort of a dedicated stair to get up there and might impact the admin depending on the procedure for check-in and with some impact to the education, meaning that the media center got moved. But from a footprint standpoint, we could theoretically fit it on the second floor without increasing the footprint. So these are very broad, options to look at, but different ways in which this could be integrated into the design if you were interested in that. And what about how that would impact costs? Yeah, Dan, do you want to address that at 5500 if you want this? At 5500 we, we figured you would probably be looking at between two to two and a half million dollar ad to put that much square footage into the, the program. Yeah, 
else extrapolate the so, from a, I don't know, from a cost benefit, it would take quite some time for what we pay rent. Well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that the rent will change. I don't know what the future rent is. What's the current rent? Uh, right now, it's maybe. 3000 but at the end of the next three year contract, if we get it, I think it goes up to 91. At the end of the third year, so you know, compound that over the next however many years. I don't know how much it goes up. Right. I'll just see, does that require a uh, elevator? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's an elevator in the building uh, that, again, it would come down to procedural, like the hours and policy for check-in. Could you share an elevator? Maybe. We'd have to look at it as far as, you know, if it would need, maybe there are lock off doors that allow you to use that center piece of the corridor in off hours that wouldn't affect the educational spaces in a way that closes them off and locks them. But we have an elevator already in the building. Sorry, I'm talking about you. There's already an elevator currently, so we look at being able to use that same one rather than having to add one specific to the central admin space. So I have one more cost question. And I said to you two and a half million dollars. I'm assuming that's assuming I don't know what the cost per square footage that would be. Do you know what that was that figured at a per square foot top cost? Yeah, it's basically taking the square footage cost of the building that we have now that yeah. we're extrapolating out and adding this square footage to So it would be, I guess what I'm saying is, what's that cost per square foot versus if you were just to build a building? Does anybody have that comparison? I mean, outside of the school yeah. exactly. requirements of the exactly. building. Okay, I'm, paying I'm actually trade doing on. that <laughs> building right now for another client, <laughs> yeah. and that building is $2.2 million. So it's about six, it's roughly 6,000 square feet, and it has, that's the same program, it's an administration for a building for a district, and that building's coming, you know, we're actually going to open the bids next week, but we're trying to towards, you know, 2.1, 2.2. So it's an entirely separate it's building? entirely separate building on, it's on the same site as the, the school that was So really, in terms of a cost differential between putting it in an educational facility versus having it separate, is there a huge one? Um, in some ways, it's less expensive to have it separate because the building code allows you to do different things when the building is a separate business use versus being put in with the education that you use. So this, what we're doing here is we're going to have to maintain the same code requirements and the same construction level in the admins area, the central admin, as we would with the rest of the building. But if you're building it separately, in the case of like the one I'm doing for Williamstown, that's a much different building. It's a less expensive building overall. So we're probably at the end of the day, since it's not in the school, we're probably saving half a million dollars on putting in the school. But so just to be clear, the estimates you're looking at for all three of these options of having central administrative space <coughs> in the school are between two and two and a half million. That's just which straight ahead of the five somewhere square feet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, somewhere. Doesn't yeah. matter where it is in the building. You could, you know, if we start to split pieces, we could say, oh, well, if it's on the second floor, we need an elevator, sure. or 100 grand, but it's just as a ballpark but in, in that range. Okay. Another client you're working with, a, a separate building, is 2.2. It's less expensive. Yep. Well, it's, it's, no, it's not. It's right in the middle. It's, it's two, two, two and a half. It's a thousand more square feet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I would think it would be worth looking at what, unless you happen to have this in front of you, we're looking at a 25-year bond on this. Is that right? For the project? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So what you know what what are the relative cost deltas between principal and interest on this marginal cost in the project versus the known rent today plus the average rate of increase of that rent the past three or so years and you can extrapolate that out and get a very very easy, you know, delta there, which I think should be looked at soon. Um. <coughs> the next question. 
Yeah. I think the other piece of this that we really haven't gotten into is the traffic because it does have an impact on if this building does, if that piece of the scope does get added, it probably has an impact. Right, we specifically sort of held on the site and the traffic knowing that the node was, would be here tonight and presenting it and then recognizing if that changed anything before we went through the effort of, you know, reconfiguring any site implications. So. But I think having the cost comparison or differential is really important. So who's doing that? That's my who can do that? <laughs> Who? Yeah, we can, we can put that together. Okay. These guys. <laughs> Don't everybody Tears. jump up at once <laughs> now. <laughs> we did the red square side. Of it. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm assuming, oh. hypothetically, if we went down that road, we'd have to obviously get and this EA approval, all of that. And there's no guarantee that they would do that in this project. Is that they, there are projects out there that are including it. Arlington High School has their central admin in it. They just don't pay for it. They will write over and over and over and yes. remind you over and over. <laughs> there. There's no but impact like a, the overall approval of that project. No. no. Well, it's unlike not a pool like the pool where they're saying no, never, no, not, not, not participating. Yeah. Central yeah. admin can be, they just okay. won't. Okay. They, they, could, yeah. they could ask you to include it separately as a separate vote. Like, like we discussed like the with the senior space. space. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 They might not, yeah. then they yeah. might. Mm -hmm. That's true. So we vote off. Yeah. Oh, wow. I wouldn't entirely rule out the idea that they might not approve it, only because I've seen them evolve on certain issues. And yeah. We, uh, the community space that we are still hanging on to proposing, um, we'd like to see clarification, but in that instance, they, their language we state that we cannot be part of the project. Okay. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Vinod Kalitiri, I'm a transportation engineer with the firm of uh, Thai and Mar, part of the C20, uh, working on the elementary school project here in Houston. Um, I met several of you a few previous occasions, including going all the way back to the SBA interview. Um, we have since obviously done a lot of work on transportation traffic. I haven't presented to this group or in the town yet. This is my first presentation here. Uh, but I've been working with the team in the background on site access, circulation, transportation, <coughs> parking, and various things. So um, what I'm hoping today over the next, I think there are about 22 or 23 slides uh, that relate to transportation. Uh, I wanted to give you an update on where we are with traffic issues. Uh, it's still, the, the study is still being developed. We're still working on analysis. So some of the information you'll see tonight uh, is still in a draft form. You'll see a watermark on it saying you know, this is subject to change. But you know, you'll, you'll get a pretty good understanding of how we're looking at traffic, what the issues are, and how we're heading towards solving them. You know, we don't have all the answers right now, but you know, do a pretty good handle on where we're heading to the traffic study. Uh, just a quick outline on what I'll cover today. Uh, you know, just an overview of what the traffic study will include, what we are doing at this time. I have some charts and paragraphs and slides that can kind of get into a little bit of the detail of nuts and bolts of the traffic information. Uh, there are a couple of slides that you have seen before that talk about the two uh, RQ options, the consolidated options. So we talk about those options from a transportation point of view, side access and circulation, and then you know, wrap it up with what else is meant to be done. Uh, this is not a case to be right? um, so we started way back when we started uh, in the fall, uh, started working with the project team, uh, working on figuring out access and transportation issues for all scenarios that we were looking at, both at the sector, school, as well as Parkview. Uh, 
so that was, I would characterize that as a preliminary traffic review, so we got into the details just enough so we could understand how the site needs to be laid out, what the stacking lengths need to be, where the pickup and drop box would go, but it was all focused on the individual plans. It wasn't looking at uh, comprehensive, especially in the case of Parkview, we had looked at the, uh, the school complex, which obviously includes a lot more than just the Parkview school itself. So that was the initial review we did, and then uh, since then, working with the team and several people here, we have uh, developed a very detailed scope for transportation traffic analysis to look at the entire school complex within which the new consolidated school would go if you pick Parkview as the site. Uh, met with uh, several folks here back in February to scope uh, traffic study. Uh, we talked about the areas that we'll be focusing on, the analysis that we'll be doing, and got uh, very useful feedback. And uh, a lot of that is built into some of the charts and the data that I'll be presenting. So what you see in the, in the black bullets there are things that we've already completed at this point. All the data collection has been done. Uh, what you see in red are the items that we are working on currently as leading up to this presentation. I was printing draft information so I could put them on the slides. Uh, but then the last step would be to actually quantify all of the impacts, the traffic impacts, parking impacts, and then identifying ways to handle that. We have some general ideas of what we could be looking at but packaging all of that would be the last step of the traffic study. <coughs> so just uh, for context, obviously we all know where the three schools are located, Parkview, and then uh, Morrow Hall, and, uh, and Central School. Uh, but the location of the schools in this part of town is, is kind of critical in terms of when you look at the future conditions, you know, what roads to parents take as they get to Parkview if you're going to Morrow Hall today or if you're going to Central School today, how would their travel patterns change and how would that affect <coughs> traffic flow and, and traffic impacts? So that the locations of the schools do play a significant role in that. Uh, in addition to looking at the three individual schools, we also, again, as I mentioned, took a very deep look at, at the entire school complex. You know, it's a little bit difficult to read the bullets there, but obviously the middle school, which is an Olmstead, the high school, and then the Parkview site itself. Uh, and then the blue lines that you see there are sort of the, the main spines so of the roads that, that feed and support the, the access and egress into the school complex today. So we have a lot of data that, that we've collected within the school complex over the last month or so. Uh, so the primary purpose of the traffic study, again, uh, in, in read the bullets, but it's primarily intended to quantify the impacts of, of having a consolidated school <coughs> on the Parkview site, uh, looking at access, circulation, uh, parking, pedestrian safety, uh, ability to sep uh, separate buses and, and parent pickup drop-off areas, which is key for safety. Uh, and then understanding, uh, with that understanding of the traffic impacts, and you know, we can figure out what the mitigation measures need to be. And it doesn't necessarily need to just support uh, Parkview or, or the new elementary school, it would also need to support the entire school complex because there are certain issues out there today, as, as you all know, with how traffic flows through that area. So we'll, we'll try to address some of those concerns as well. Uh, we collected a lot of data for, again, over the last month or so. There's daily traffic counts, there are peak period traffic counts, the morning peak time when the parents and are coming in to drop off the, uh, their students, the, the, the uh, staff and faculty, uh, as well as you know, student drivers within, within the school complex area. Uh, we look at safety, we look at roadway geometry, we look at crash data. Uh, five years of uh, crash data within the, the school complex area to get an understanding of safety concerns uh, for vehicular and pedestrian traffic. Uh, we'll also be seeking, as we've already started with the February meeting, we'll be working with the town officials to uh, ensure that your concerns are addressed as part of the, the traffic work. And obviously a lot of this is based in field observations. We constantly have staff or our vendors out in the school complex area or Morrow Hall or Central School 
collecting data, observing traffic flow and traffic patterns, so we can use that information in our traffic study. Uh, so that map, what you see there in, in the orange dots, are uh, specific locations within the school complex where we collected traffic counts both during the morning, uh, drop off to 7.15 to 9.15 in the morning, and then the afternoon peak time, which is around between 2 and 4. Uh, those times represent the peak traffic activity within the school complex. There are some bars, blue color bars that you see there, it's a little bit difficult to see on this map. Those represent daily traffic counts. So in addition to looking at traffic just during the morning and afternoon peak times, we also looked at the traffic going into and out of the school complex over the course of the entire day so we understand how <coughs> things change, let's say, midday as well. And then we specifically looked at the driveways for each of the three schools that are being uh, considered for consolidation. So we looked at the access points, those orange uh, shapes that you see there where our traffic count vendor actually had equipment set up to count the number of cars, pedestrians, and buses traveling through each of those points. So we did that at the Parkview School. We did that at Center School, and we also did that for the curb cuts, the driveways for, for Morrow Hall. So all of that data fed into the analysis. So one of the key things that I've heard right from the beginning about the consolidated school uh, is, you know, how would you add more cars to that area without making things worse, because there's already congestion and, and traffic concerns. So the thing that uh, you need to look at when you get traffic impacts is, is the distribution of traffic over time. So what you see here, and I, and I apologize, it's a little difficult to read, but this is 7.15 a.m. right here in five minute intervals going to 9.15 a.m. So every five minutes, each of these bars represent the number of cars entering and exiting the school complex. And then the same similar chart here for the afternoon starts at 2 p.m. and goes all the way to 4 p.m. in five minute intervals. The blue bars represent cars. The red, the little sharp red bars represent buses. And this is today for what happens at the school complex. And what you see here down below are the times, the school start time. So you can see that the high school, middle school, it starts at, uh, I believe, 7.55 a.m. So you, a lot of these bars represent the traffic activity associated with the high school and middle school. And as soon as the high school starts, you'll see a dramatic drop in traffic in the area within the school complex. And then it again picks up the time when Richardson Olmsted starts, and you see that shorter spike in traffic. So that's associated with Richards and Olmsted. And then once that's that's around 8.40 a.m. And then that tapers off five or 10 minutes after school starts here in this building. And then you again have a very short spike here when Parkview uh, starts. That's at 9.10, 9.10 a.m. So what you can actually see is the time when we're trying to add traffic to the overall system, to the roadway network, is the time when you actually have very, very little happen hours that there is parkview traffic going in and out at that time. But that traffic is really nothing compared to what you see, you know, 7, let's say 7.30 to 8.30 or 7.45 to 8.45. So you would be adding to the bars that are at the, the, at the end of the timeline here. You're not really adding to the bars here. So when you actually add the additional traffic from uh, uh, Central School and Morrow Hall to the bars back here, the overall lines still fall below the peak time that you have when, when the high school, <coughs> high school uh, starts. You see a similar pattern for the afternoon peak, but the overall numbers are a little bit lower, especially for the high school, because a lot of students stay back, they don't leave exactly at this little time. Uh, but the same type of issue you'll see here where you know, when uh, Parkview is let out, the, the traffic volume is not as high as what you would expect during uh, the time when the high school and middle school are let out. Um, so 
this is another chart that shows the cumulative effect of the three schools. So the blue represents Parkview traffic. Uh, the orange represents uh, Morrow Hall. And then the green represents Santa School. So if you were to take the students, uh, the parent vehicles going in and out of each of the three schools today, and you're to stack them up, essentially this is what you'd be seeing. So instead of seeing a blue line here today at Parkview, you'd be seeing this in that five minute period, you would see this consolidated bar that includes all three schools. But if you were to take that bar, tack it on top of the Parkview uh, chart here, it would still fall below the peak number that you saw, uh, that you see for the, for the high school. Um, we, we are working on these numbers a little bit, so that's why I have the draft watermark saying it's, it's still a uh, work in progress, but the general patterns would hold to what you see on this graph. And similarly in the afternoon, uh, when our views light up, you, you do see that spike in traffic around uh, kind of the time when, when uh, park views light up at 3.30. Uh, we also look at. Can we? Sorry, can question. We, yeah. So um, I think it's important. I, I, I want to confirm, but make sure anyone is watching. That is these charts right there are just indicative of the uh, three K to twos, correct? These two right here. Yes. 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 Right. Okay. So just because in contrast to the slide before, it right. looks like you're. <clears throat> it, it yeah. Looks like you're changing the scale and that it's Sorry. blowing up on the back end, and that's not what that this is. is. I agree. Um, do you have a graph that overlays yeah. this onto the prior one? Mm -hmm. So that's something that we're working okay. on. And yeah, so what I should have done on this one is essentially have this the vertical right. scale yeah. Yeah. Right. the same as the other one. Right. Just so folks so at home don't see, you know the morning uh, currently has a peak here, and if we did a consolidated school, it just puts everyone in yeah. the high school at the end, because that's obviously not what the data is right. trying to right. So what's the, what's the number of the highest peak on the right-hand side on this graph compared to the, on, on the, on the I'm yeah. sorry, on the left graph? On the left graph, so yeah. 95. Uh, 95. 95. 95. So what was the high high school. School. On the previous graph, what was the highest peak? So I can get it. Uh, almost it's three. Yeah. It's oh, okay. almost 300 at the high school. That's because of all the high school kids driving to work. Right. Right. Yeah, schools. more cars traveling on the okay. system right. during the morning. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my question. Is this accounts for people going in, going out, high school kids that come in and park? Yes. So you're looking at the access all around the right. right. We look at Randall, access off of Randall Street, Columbus, we look at Spooner, <coughs> we look at uh, Lothrop. So we look at all of the access points into and out of the school complex. And all of the data that we've collected is this for all of the students. Okay. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Alicia, are the K-2 schools different start times? No. They're, they're all the same time? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. What time is that? Nine ten to three twenty five. Twenty five. Okay. September. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Is this considered the construction crews are going to be floating through and that come later? Are the moving of the central measures registration or the administration is you know, because there's gonna be a lot of construction people coming around here. Um, that may will so, that consider something like that? I think right now what we're just looking at is if this school was done, Final. what are the Final. what are the traffic patterns? You're you're right that at oh, some okay. point we will have to consider as the process is happening, but I think right now for our immediate <coughs> concerns, we're just trying to get a sense of what's the impact on if this were a consolidated Permanent. school site. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. That there would be a separate construction right. traffic management plan that would address uh, <coughs> impacts during the construction. Right. Me again. I, I live very close to the project and I can look out my window and watch the cars go by. But there's a significant amount of cars that go down the school night from the middle school, and more so than even the parking. I can tell because the parking lots are empty in the morning. As they start earlier, they're coming through like crazy. Because that's what they, they do. I don't know how the teachers would do it all, but the parents are bringing the kids up and coming back down to an up school night dropping off the parking and somehow get it back. I can't, I can't figure out, I've been up there a couple of times and watched it. So it's quite a mess though all around the streets. They queue up 
halfway down the street, which mm -hmm. kept safe the limits. Sure. But there are part awful of this lot of them, and they talk once he had group about possibly <coughs> blocking the uh, middle school from coming down school. Because it's a, it's a and they have to go back down Columbus F. We, we actually shared that concern when we met with them. We actually explained to them that that happens and how people go to one school to drop off their kids even though they're at a different school. So they have yeah. all that information. I think you're going to address that? Yes, as, okay. part of, as part of the improvements, there will be a series of recommendations okay. that we'll be reviewing with your draft form to mm -hmm. understand what makes the most sense. Yeah. But I do understand that currently for Richardson Olmstead, there are two drop-off points. Mm -hmm. One is via the driveway that you have, but then the other informal drop-off is in the middle school parking lot, right. as you said, and then the students walk between the parking lot right. through the through the network of walk. It's, it's a know, valid we question. Answer. We shared the same concern, so he, he does know that, fortunately. Yeah. That starts at 7 in the morning, you said, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the bar on the left side, that's actually 7.15. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, so typically most construction workers are on the site by no later than 6.30 in the morning. Um, the exception might be the, the site work subcontractors, they can't make noise that early in the morning. Um, but you might only have a dozen site work subcontractors. Once the building well, is The local crews here that I talked to the construction, maybe even the bidding on this, mm -hmm. said 7 o'clock is that start. Yep, that's their start. And yeah, that, they'll be there at 7. Yep, yep, they're usually there a little bit earlier, and if you let them start at 6 inside the building and apply work, they usually take advantage. So, another uh, set of data that we'll be looking at is, is crash data. Uh, and again, just for, for reference, I showed some of the, the GIS mapping and the data that we put together for crashes. Uh, we do look at five years of crash data within this area, and what you see there in the red dots uh, actually represent crashes, and then we generate summary charts that explain what types of crashes they are, what time of the day they happen, you know, what the roadway conditions were, whether it was a pedestrian collision or if it's just vehicles. There's, there's a lot of detail, granular detail to the crash analysis that you would see as part of the traffic study that looks at safety concerns and, and whether there are ways we can address or mitigate those concerns as part of this project. Uh, the other thing, and this is very helpful data, and I'm glad David was able to help us pull this data together. Uh, this is the place of residence data for all students, uh, K through 12, in Easton and we were able to get that data, and then we had, I had our GIS department translate the spreadsheet information into, into GIS files so you could actually see a mapping. And what you see here is actually Parkview, Parkview students, where they live currently. So Parkview is, is right in the middle. Uh, the, actually, all three schools, uh, four schools right there in the, in the uh, school complex. The circle represents the one and a half mile radius, which is the cutoff for bus transportation. And the, you know, the red dots, you know, the size of the dot represents how many students are in that general area. Uh, so you can actually see how, how that splits up. And you know, based on the data that we were provided and, and running it through a GIS model, there are about 183 students currently at Parkview that live within that one and a half mile radius of Parkview. So presumably everyone outside of that who have access to free bus transportation can choose to do so if they want it. Did that include students from Center and Moreau who also might be inside that radius? Right, so I have a few other okay, chats sorry. I'm So this is current Parkview, current Parkview data. The, the data was, is, there's a lot of resolution to it so we were able to you know, slice and dice it in different ways. Uh, so that's the Moro Hall data. We'll see about 132 students at Moro Hall currently fall within that uh, one and a half mile radius. And then you look at it for Center School, and interestingly, there's only about 92 students at, compared to the other two schools. There's, there's fewer students within that one and a half mile radius for Center School uh, than, than the other two schools. It's a smaller number. Uh, but then the last one that you asked, which is sort of all of the students were put into the new school, the, the consolidated school, and you still put the one and a half mile radius. 
the GIS data analysis of where students live and, and what roads are convenient for them to get to our view, you can expect about half, 50% of those students coming up Center Street. And that's a function of where the other two schools are today, the Center, Center School and Moro Hall students. A lot of them would end up being part of the 52%. Uh, similarly, if you looked at Main Street, you'd have 11% of, of the future school traffic but our view would be on Main Street coming from the east, about 7% on Main Street coming from the north. Uh, so again, the percentages don't necessarily mean anything at this point, but this feeds into our analysis of impacts to figure out what intersections could be impacted and what type of mitigation we might need to have to address those impacts. Uh, so another data set that we obtained uh, as part of this project was the parent survey. So there was a pretty substantial parent survey that was conducted to find out what mode of transportation uh, their students use most often. Obviously it changes from day to day based on weather conditions or you know, parents' schedules and things like that. But if you were to ask them about their primary mode of travel, you would see that uh, pre-K through two, or essentially K through two, I'd say, under current conditions, 65% of the, of the parents uh, said that bus is their primary mode of transportation. And there was another question about if there was a new school, and so central school students and uh, Moro Hall students go to the same location as Parkview, the percentage does not change surprisingly. Again, about 65, 66% of the parents said that they would choose to send their kids to school by bus. Um, so it's interesting to note that today Parkview or K through two, they use about 65 to 66%. And in the future with the new school location, it would be about the same. When you look at our traffic data, so the, the left two uh, charts are from the survey. The, the charts on the right side is actually the mode of travel data that we observed as part of our traffic count. So the buses, we had the bus drivers count the number of students that were on the bus at the time of the traffic count. So that's an exact accurate number of how many students for each of the three elementary schools uh, were on the bus. That number is about 55%. So in reality, only about 55% of the students are on the bus, whereas when you ask the parents as part of the survey, they would say, and that's about 65. So there's about a 10% discrepancy between the two percentages. But in either case, 65 or 55 are pretty high. Uh, what is even more interesting after that is, is actually one of the charts uh, on the next slide where the question was, is there anything we could do different to have you send your child by bus if you're not doing so currently. And one of the first, uh, would you like to the, the, the top, just the top yes. one? Yes. The top one says shorter bus ride, better time coordination. Mm -hmm. So that was by far the biggest uh, reason that parents quoted as, you know, if, if there was a shorter bus ride or better time coordination that they would be willing to send their child by bus. Uh, on the flip side of it, free fare. So if there was no charge for bus transportation, would that change your decision on whether or not you send your student by bus was the bar that has the lowest response. So yeah, the, the charge for transportation is not the motivating factor for parents to choose bus transportation or not. It's, it's a convenience factor and the times and start and end times. So. Based on this, what I would say is unless there was something drastic that changes with schedules or hours or start and end times, you are probably going to be seeing about the same level of bus usage uh, for the new school, which again helps us figure out how many cars there will be, and then we can run the analysis based on it. So that, that's really part of the information that we're using here. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, bench line information, uh, benchmark information like this, generally about an even spread of uh, responses between pre-K through two and nine through 12 is about even responses. So we did get uh, uniform feedback from all grades when uh, parents were responding to, to the questions. Uh, 
then quickly switching over to the site access and circulation. And some of these I'm sure you've seen as part of uh, some of the other site presentations. That's the existing condition uh, for Parkview, Spooner Street goes left to right. You have the uh, middle school parking lot and then the high school access and circulation, uh, Richardson Olmstead access point right here. Um, look at the matrix, matrices. So one of the options uh, you looked at was a brand new school on the back side of the property where, where the fields are located currently and then creating a new uh, athletic fields and, and uh, recreational areas on the front side of the campus. This is alternative two where you, you add on to the existing school and maintain as much of the uh, you know, green space behind the property and the side of the property. In each of these scenarios, you would see that we are creating a substantial drop-off loop that goes around the buildings uh, that can accommodate the long queues that we would expect. Today, if you were out there when Parkview starts or ends, you see all the cars parked on the street, you know, parents walk, you know, they, they wait to pick up their child, or in the morning they go, go through the loop, drop off their ch uh, children, and then they leave. Uh, but a lot of that happens on Spooner Street, which is a public road, and that does cause some friction with pedestrian traffic and, and others that are on Spooner Street uh, unrelated to the park view or the middle school. Uh, but what both these site plans do is, is it creates substantial drop-off areas on the back side of uh, going around the building so that we can actually stack all of the vehicles off the street uh, obviously, this, this still need to be refined, but you know, as part of our initial review, uh, some of these uh, parameters have been set in terms of how much of stacking and the store of the vehicles, and also for parking. Uh, on both sides of these graphics, you'll see features to consider that I do want to point out, and I think some of these will come in as we get into the mitigation of the traffic improvements. Some of it we talked about during the kickoff meeting uh, we had in February. Uh, this access plan currently shows the connection to the middle school parking lot uh, being cut off. So there's a new driveway that takes you all the way down to Columbus Avenue. But if you are coming down Spooner Street and you, you want to go to the middle school parking lot, uh, you would come down Spooner use the new driveway, go down this new driveway, come down Columbus, and then enter the, the middle school parking lot from the other side. So this does make that access circuitous, and you know, do you want to maintain that connection into the parking lot, or do you want uh, to remove that to, to help improve uh, traffic flow associated with the park? Uh, the other thing that we talked about very early on, and it's still something that we thinking about is should there be a connection between uh, Columbus and Lothrop through the campus. Today, if you had to travel between Columbus and Lothrop, either you snake through the middle school parking lot, or you use Sheridan, or you use the, the loop behind the high school to be all the way behind all the schools and get to Columbus. A new connection that connects Columbus to Lothrop creates uh, an additional spine road through the campus to be able to disperse traffic over multiple streets. So that was an option that we talked about. And a variation on that is access to uh, Parkview via Lothra. Uh, so rather than having a full connection all the way to Columbus, what if a connection to Parkview was created off of, off of uh, Lothra Street? So again, you have addition, an additional access point to come to and, and leave the Parkview, uh, Parkview facility and reduce the amount of traffic that, for example, you might have at the intersection of Sheridan and Spooner. And then there's also some discussion about this pedestrian path that you see there between the school building and Sheridan and whether that should be maintained or reconfigured to to serve some other purpose uh, to avoid the possibility of parents dropping off their children on Sheridan to use the, the walkway to the school. So both these options 
uh, all of these uh, ideas or, or possibilities still exist. And as we go through the traffic study, we'll be evaluating some of these in more detail to see if that would help offset some of the traffic impacts. And obviously, bring those findings back to the screen. So, uh, I think the last thing I had was that slide again. It's a repeat of the previous slide where it kind of outlines the remaining steps where we are analyzing the, the data, quantifying the impacts, and we need to come up with a set of mitigation measures that will address the impacts. But based on the analysis that we have done today, I haven't seen any what you might call as fatal flaws or anything like that that would preclude you from considering Parkview as, as a site for the consolidated school. Obviously, we do need to finish all of our analysis and ensure the numbers work. At this stage, we feel pretty comfortable that there are ways to address the traffic flow concerns. <coughs> Questions, comments? I have a question. Um, I don't know if Mr. Field is here tonight. Yep. Oh, I <laughs> uh, My question will be, um, are you um, kind of representing the residents of this entire well, I, I, I work for the. As far as the yeah. town is concerned, when it comes to safety issues, uh, signage. You're out there. Oh, there you go. Oh. Uh, I'm just concerned about the additional cost that the town made for us because we're going to need additional signage. We're going to need um, more stop signs because people do not stop and roll. Even I, I've stood up with the uh, traffic. Um, monitor and I stood on the corner of Parky of Spooner Street and Sheridan Street and those cars do not always come to a complete stop. They will and I have them come out of Western um Daily Poplin. Poplin has a stop sign, roll through. Daily has no stop sign. Centers they're they're pretty good at Columbus Ave stopping. But they roll, and when they roll, even if a pedestrian is on the sidewalk, because I walk the area a lot, if a pedestrian is on the sidewalk at the corner, they will turn in front of you before they stop to let you to let you cross. It's very dangerous. You have to be very alert. And so I, I really think, and I think a lot of on this traffic study, Center Street is really a, a pass through for many people coming up from. Taunton or Bay Road, because that's how I used to travel to and from work. Center Street uh, speed limit should be brought down, and I think the speed limit on Sheridan Street should be brought down to 25 miles an hour. I think the signage is needed to let people know that during certain times of day, people are crossing the street and there is a lot more traffic. So I think you need a lot of work on Sheridan and Center Street, because the end of Center Street especially is 40 miles an hour from Spooner Street down. And, and uh, there are a lot of, there are still more intersections here. There's Wilbur, there's Walter, there's Stanley. And they're going very fast out of the but, And they go fast all day long. And I, I really think we need some, some help with slowing the traffic down. Yeah, and my job as uh, Director of Public Works, um, we're going to review all the proposals, work with the engineers here to make sure that what's done we feel comfortable with. I'm on the traffic safety committee with the police chief and the fire chief. We'll make sure that uh, we weigh in on that. Um, but as far as your concerns, I I agree. That, you know, but you can probably ask anyone in any part of town, and they're going to have the same issues of traffic and just general conditions of speed, things like that. We can only do so much. What we're doing with the school complex is what we're trying to make sure that we don't uh, make anything worse. And if, if we can't make it better, we will. I don't think you'll change traffic on Center Street necessarily, uh, you know, that's a bigger ask than this project, but well, we're going to make sure. Well, said that Center Street, they're going to be coming up from um, South Carolina East. True. Then, Center Street from the Wall Hall. There's no question it'll be added trips, but Center Street itself has about 8,000 vehicles a day on it already. I'm that's, sure. that's not, this, the school traffic won't be a significant portion of the Center Street traffic, but uh, we'll make sure that we review everything. And if signage is needed, I think that it should be put into the budget so that we can have additional signage. I, I believe that any traffic impacts that are need to be mitigated as part of this project, it would be part of this project. I think, too, just if I could, you know, we live near there, you get this. 
they do U-turns when you're in the back and up. And they leave their cars. And they go up to get the kids and go back. Sometimes good things, sometimes poor. It's just a mess and that's the that whole problem. Because, you know, they do it leaving their cars. The cars can't get through. And in the morning, on uh, Spooner Street, you can't go past the car. Because there's so many cars coming back the other way. And the buses, the big buses. I think that's part of what they were addressing with the long drop-off queues yeah. that they're adding, and that is going to alleviate that very issue that you're talking about. It may go, well, obviously it doesn't go through, it's not going to make any impact. But yeah, what you're saying with all that backup, that long queue is going to give space for all those cars to go in, and they won't be in front of your house. I just don't think they should do a U-turn in the street either. Right, but I think that's a concern that this committee can't address. I think that would be better addressed. Um, the that. That's outside. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah, that, that's outside the scope of this right. committee, though. We can't. I mean, I would love to fix all that, too. I, I, I used to live on Center Street, I know. Um, but we can't. We can't change anything about that here. But I think what we can do, and I think what we're trying to do, is to anticipate what all yeah. of the issues could be and to remediate them to the best of our ability. But I think there is, you just said, I heard you say it yourself, is there's a certain point where you can't manage that behavior. You know? yeah. And I do have a question for you about um, analyzing the current conditions. Is that going to include traffic flow during drop-off and pickups throughout the entire campus? Because I know one major issue that I think has been brought up is the RO school with the multiple parking lots and whatnot. Is that data going to be analyzed and presented to us in the next meeting? Uh, so we do have the data. We have, you know, how many cars, uh, you know, some of those charts we actually saw, you know, like 8.40 a.m. when uh, Richardson Olmsted starts. Leading up to that time, you see the big spike in cars just, just uh, at the driveway as well as within the Spooner Street access into the middle school parking lot. Uh, in terms of analyzing that data, we, yeah, we can we can present that information in the next meeting. So you can yeah. see actually what exactly happens with the RO uh, peak time compared I mean, I to the other peaks. I think my, because we have the raw numbers, and that's, that looking at the curves and whatnot is incredibly important. But was there an analysis done of the actual flow? Like where cars are getting um, choked up and... Yeah. That's yeah. That that's the analysis that we are going through right now. That's, that that's was my ongoing. question. Yes. All right, thank that you. That analysis so much. is ongoing. Awesome. When when do you expect to finish the study and present it to us? So the the analytical work, the actual analysis, and you know the condition and the hot spots where where we need to look at mitigation. Uh, I'd say we are probably about two weeks away from having those results. Uh, the actual results about. You know, where, where the hot spots are. But I think our goal leading up to that point is to make sure that if we do find a fatal flaw or an issue that, that's insurmountable, that we would bring that to the team's attention so we can actually tackle it right now rather than wait for the full study to be complete. And as I mentioned earlier, we haven't come across any of those at this point. Yeah, we gotta go through the analysis and make sure everything works, but based on the order of magnitude of the numbers, that we are seeing, it looks like the numbers can work. I, I have a concern that this study is not going to be done in time to make the May submit because I think we need to see what the mitigation is, what options we have to alleviate the problem if we're going to go with this option. I think it's going to be tough to finish that well, by the time we, this report we, goes in. We will have, the, I mean, for the May meeting, yeah, I mean, we still have all of April, so we, I mean, well, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is that this is supposed to win on May 8th. And this committee, I think, needs time to, you know, to, uh, to look at those mitigation measures and digest what they're saying and come up with whether or not uh, a recommendation of whether or not we want this site. And a lot of that depends on this traffic study. Don't so, we have to submit the site anyway, though? May 8th, or no, so it's the that. one. That's the oh, one. Oh, that's thank one. you. But I guess my question is, do we have to have everything mapped out? I mean, we're not going to have a, a, a 
detailed, well, we'll have schematic design, but we won't have detailed designs at that point. And I would think what we're looking for, and let's talk about this, is, is exactly what you just said, is are there fatal flaws that are going to prevent us from using this site, from making this site work? Because I think that's a different question than do we have to have everything, everything figured out? And I don't know. I'm going to put it to the committee because it's, it's... It comes down to, to some degree, what the committee is comfortable with. Right. But usually you don't see this level of uh, analysis or traffic study until later when there's a single design. We have it a little bit earlier now and we were, we were intending to present progress to help uh, find out if there were in fact any fatal flaws or real deep concerns that might give pause. Um, but when we submit the PSR, we're really making a, uh, it's not a final design by any stretch. Um, schematic design will certainly be a place where a lot of things get flushed out. Um, to add, one thing that, st uh, that struck me is even though the volume of cars is not equal to that of a high school or middle school, can those side roads, because they are much smaller than what the arteries that lead into the high school and the middle school campus, Spooner Street and the other roads are much smaller and cannot handle as much. So even though they will not be necessarily very the same volume, it could have a negative impact to the overall flow at the Parkview site. Do you, do, am I explaining this clearly? I think so. Okay. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, we, we have you know that I mean? analysis yeah. going on, but what I can say is when you do see those tall spikes in traffic for like 8 a.m., yeah. those cars are on uh, loads of street. They are on uh, random. I mean, they are on they're relatively on narrow street. Street. Yeah, they, they're, we're not looking at Center Street for the high school traffic and looking at Spooner for yeah. Park View. And we're looking at yeah. similar scale, similarly scaled roadways. Okay. Uh, for impact analysis, but I, I, but I do want to note that yeah, we do have to go through that analysis, look at the roadway peak time, which yeah. is 8 a.m., and then the school peak time, which is 9.15 or 9.10. So you will be looking at both, and then you could do a side-by-side -side comparison and, and say, yeah, you, when you look at the school peak, it still is better than, than the roadway peak, which happens right at the high school summer. So the general symptom is showing that what we know now, we can move ahead to the next step with it, you know, looking at a deeper analysis, but there's nothing that's screaming at us right now that this is an inappropriate suggestion. So, I mean, so next week, or not next week, but in two weeks when we meet next, we're going to get this data, and we're going to, it's either going to say this is feasible or it's not feasible. Well, I think, right? I mean, won't mm -hmm. it be pretty clear cut? Like the yeah, but if there's no point in bills now, right. I, I mean, think it's saying no that. Well, I know. Right. the underlying data would probably not bear out, so unless there's some sort of strange outlier that, that comes into that, that existing data. Right, so my point is is that I, I get what you're saying, that this is a big decision to make in a short period of time, but you know, all the data is looking like this is not going to be prohibitive. Right. Right. How we do it, we can decide later. But it's possible how it's done. The overall amount of flow. Right. So I feel like your fear is we're gonna we're right. gonna sit here and we're gonna be like, well, we don't we don't know if we can recommend this or not. Well, I think we have an obligation to um, to make the situation better, or at least not make it worse. And part of that is um, how we lay out the site. How do we mitigate the the data? The data is the whole complex. How do you mitigate the data for each point, for each entry point into the complex? And we have to make sure that, for example, if that's the site design, that the queue, the queue times that we have, or the queue lengths, um, work and alleviate the problem on Spooner, for example, or other entry points into the complex. So it's not just the data. So well, there are those site layout questions in that level specificity, things that necessarily come after, or? Yeah, we, we're applying no means fixed into the, the site layout at this point, the roads in and out, uh, the parking area, 
even the, the shape of the building could change and have minor deviations. That level of detail really happens in schematic design after this. Really all we're telling the MSBA now is the uh, preferred solution is either ad rental or new on the park view site. And the building's gonna be approximately this size and house these grades. I think you, yeah, if Sorry. I'm hearing you correctly, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I just want to see if I'm synthesizing this correctly. I think what you're saying is what we all feel. We would love to have like the final designs go, yes, it'll come here, it'll make the cars go down to this amount and everything else. But we're in the feasibility stage right now. And I think what they're saying is in order to move forward after, fe you just have to find out, is it feasible? Are there multiple options where you could choose one, two, or what were there, five of them? Um, that could make it work because again we don't know the shape of the building so you can't even necessarily count the number of cars but is it big enough to know that that's an option and then those other four things are also options I think that's what you're saying and I think that's what you're saying I don't think we're gonna have a final design because we have we're not paying for a final design we're paying for a feasibility and schematic design and that's what we've done with the buildings even so far. We've said this is feasible or this isn't feasible, that we have to, as a committee, say this is or isn't feasible based on the fact that we have options to mitigate the traffic. And I think what you're saying is that we do have options to mitigate the traffic and you don't see fatal flaws yet. That, that was my point, yes. What, what I would add is, for example, just, just to alleviate some concerns there. Let's say the traffic study as we advance over the next two weeks suggests that there's a need for an additional access point for parking. Let's say it needs to be off of lot. But again, you, you don't have, you know, you're not advancing the design for the final condition to be able to, you know, put all the detail on it. But what we can do is make sure that we do not preclude that solution from happening when we get into final design. So we would say that you know you may need to have an additional access point, and this is where it might go, and then we'll actually you know, that will take care of problem X. And our design at this stage is not going to block that or make that not work. So it's it, you're leaving that option open. So we, you will have enough level of comfort that that there's a workable solution. So when you, with, right? when you start working on schematic, does this does the traffic pattern? get you know more flushed out the schematic design at the end of schematic design when we're submitting <coughs> would there be a sense of what what roadways in and out would look like does it that is, happen at schematic or after schematic it could be a complete solution developed so we'll go through iterations in schematic design um, and be presented as part of the, the whole design as well as the plan we'll refine as well before there's a vote on it in schematic design right after you've already chosen the preferred solution. Right, but I mean before there's a vote on whether to fund the project or not. Oh, absolutely, yes. yeah. It'll be part of the budget process, so all that we can. And, oh. Dan, I Am I right to assume that we'll have a le level of service on the existing intersections for the existing conditions now, yeah. and then with the proposed uh, combined school, with the, the traffic patterns you're assuming, will have a proposed level of service at all the intersections yes. in a couple weeks. And, that's, and then we can see, is there an impact? Is it worse than it is for the high school? Is it worse, you know, we'll have that level of service. So the committee will be able to see what the real condition is. Is it a C level or is it an F level? Do we make anything worse compared to existing conditions? And then if there is something worse, at, at a certain location, there's probably things we can do to mitigate that and push traffic to another location or add, a, add another entrance or things like that to alleviate that. Am I correct? Yes. So, I mean, that's we're going to get that analysis is everything. That's going to tell us what your condition is now and with the proposed school, what the conditions will be at those intersections. So I guess the How we get to this inside circulation, all those other things can happen after that. But we'll know, mm -hmm. does this make it worse? Or is it the same so or better in two I, weeks? Right. So when I, think that, I, I think that I think what Beth, Becky was just going to say is: so are we saying that we are not ready to make a decision yet in terms of in terms of our preferred design tonight? But we will be in two weeks when we have that information. Well, we might not be because if we get that information in two weeks, then we have questions. We need to go back and figure them out. Okay. Well, I, I just yeah. we need to remember that Search we're working well. against. May, if we miss that May deadline. That's what, that's what we're concerned about, right. yeah, is that deadline. Like, do we have feasibly enough time to make a conscious decision? Now, 
large school and it did have a favor for right. So it would be the, the center school on the center property, as it is right now. Which is the existing Which would be the existing traffic. Which is already, which is that. Which, which is already that. that. Right, so, so I think that's an important <laughs> thing to be, that we need to be mindful of. It's, it looks like where we're heading is now, yes, there's a fatal flaw in the traffic analysis where consolidated on center, so that's not really an option from that perspective. So you have the option of fix one school at center, have bad traffic, or a new school and then inequitable facilities, or probably have plenty of challenges with a consolidated school, as there are already challenges. Right, and opportunities to and opportunities to fix all, all through schools, right? So, so there's not. I don't think anyone is expecting reasonably that there's going to be something that comes back and says, "Hey, good news! This is going to fix all the schools at once." We're not only going to actualize an economy of scale in doing that. We're going to make traffic better. Everything will be an improvement. I mean, that's what I was thinking. That would be awesome. <laughs> but I don't think. Right, so I think it's, it's going to be a selection of okay. Do you, do you, do you fix? one school at that one location and not address traffic and solve that traffic? Or do you look at, to Dave's point, you're bringing up the, the, the level of service indicators and see where, yeah. where that takes us? Yeah. To Dave's point, if, if we have the, if there's no existing fatal flaws today, we have the existing traffic information that we really need to make that final decision. And there's, a, there's some sort of permutation that has to happen on the final design to make that truly fully fleshed out. We'll, we'll have a good understanding of whether or not it truly is quote unquote feasible at that point, which, you know, it looks like we're going in that direction, but yeah, we have that, we have a, a three week time frame, so we have to, to potentially go back down and ask this one. So that's, the answer is you, you would have enough time if we meet two weeks to make that decision. Yes. Okay. Right. We want to get a head start, but yeah, we, we want a head start on it though. Yeah. Can't go beyond that. Yeah, no, down the deadline. So it seems like we're obviously talking about the site. I don't hear people talking about the actual building. Is it possible we could reduce options based on what the building is? Because the building at the Parkview site is the same size. It's just whether it's ad rent or new. And the building at the center site is the same size. It's just a difference if it's ad rent or new. Can we reduce options tonight if there's not a final vote, at least on that, and have one at each site still? So to take off. So to take two off. of them off the table. Okay. Does that help you at all? It, it helps us tremendously. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. We were talking about that the last the last week that I attended, which was two ago. Right. So. What's I mean, my suggest right. My suggestion would be that we take off the two at Renos, one at Parkview and one at Center. I don't know how people do this. Just leave the two new buildings, the Center School new and the Parkview new. Both of the ad Renos are more expensive than the new and they restrict our ability to really implement the educational programming in the pods and neighborhoods like we've wanted to. And do they have additional phases of construction? And they have additional, which, yeah, which is part of the expense. Yeah. Well, it, impacting yeah. the current education plan. Yeah. So does that seem? I'd like you to articulate a motion to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just see what, what the numbers are? Um, <laughs> thanks. I'd like to make a motion that we remove the option for ad reno at center school site and the option for ad reno at the Parkview site and only focus on the remaining two options, which are the new small center school on the center school site or the new district wide school on the Parkview site. Second. All those in favor. So, I'm going to ask honestly, what's your comfort level with the fact that we move this off two more weeks? Um, because they're narrowed down, I think we can get to work on both of those. Okay. Um, with our, we'll focus on the center school. 
center site um, based on what we know now and maybe develop or refine the site and building plan. And then in a couple of weeks, we have a, a charrette scheduled with our site and traffic folks to take what they're learning and start working on a refined uh, combined school. So I think that gives us an That's next week. Yep. Is there any sort of traffic implication? I'm assuming no, for the existing, for the has to be included just renovation strictly. It's, I'm assuming it's just, since it's a renovation, it's just update to existing school, there's no traffic considerations that have to be submitted or already included in that discovery. Well, that is what we've done. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's an AAB handicap stuff that needs to be done, we may have to do traffic stuff. The, the, we have to submit the, we the, have the, to the basic submit. renovation okay. The stuff. basic one that we have to oh, submit is what Patrick is talking about. The one that they require you to submit. Just base repair. Thank you. Base repair. <laughs> So we would only carry the base repair at this point for just cost reference. Right, just, well, just to have it included. Yeah, aside from that, and on the traffic end, it, it, um, it sort of, it's a little bit of a new point, there's a status quo on the traffic. There's very, very minor changes. Um, and if we were to address traffic in the base repair, then we'd have to bump up the cost estimates, obviously. But, yeah, okay. Uh, typically, that's it's beyond the scope of the, what the NSPAC the base repair has, right? Just put up this. Right. Okay. And so what are the kinds of things, I'm just pushing a little bit, what are the kinds of things that would prevent us from building a park view? What are the kinds of things that you would see, when you say there were no fatal flaws, what do you mean by a fatal flaw? Okay. So if we were adding traffic to that area, at the time when the high school traffic is traveling on the roads. There is no capacity out there to add cars associated with, say, 500 more students coming to the day. Okay. I would say that's a pretty substantial issue. When you look at that timeline, the seven to nine or two to four, you are adding traffic to the time periods where the bars are really sharp. So that that's probably the biggest thing that gives me the comfort that they are no fatal flaws. Again, the numbers will give me the specifics, you know, the level of service that they mentioned, you know. Those are the things that you'd actually say, okay, yeah, is it getting worse, likely worse, a lot worse? I mean, we can quantify those changes, but in terms of fatal flaws, I would say the time when you add those cars is the key. Uh, and in terms of improvements, you know, you're dealing with all public streets, so the town has control, so you know, you're not dealing with skating or yeah, permanencies. Those are things, again, if you have to take property to implement an improvement, that would be a fatal flaw depending on the circumstances. But I do not see those kinds of issues as Yeah, I would also add, if we couldn't meet the parking count or a substantial queue, or if we were compromising a floor, space or the ability to separate cars and buses, then those would be you know, the one of those. But all of the positives, I mean, if I recall, I'm not looking at the list right now, but those weren't issues. No, those, no. Were, those were not in red. They weren't even, I'm trying to remember if they were even in gray. Yeah. To play slightly devil's advocate yeah. for a moment, something you mentioned last night at the uh, was that there's, and I'm going to misquote you on this, so, but there's something along the lines of recommendations for start times that are seen to be shifting in the state from a high school start time being stuff later, it seems like. I, that's obviously not part of this consideration currently, but because it's not, it's not mandated yet, but should we consider that? Uh, well, if we were to change the high school start time, we would most definitely change the elementary school start sign. So hopefully, I mean, theoretically, I don't know, but I would expect to see those two peaks shift. Okay, okay. Swap. It's a busing capacity, too, isn't it? My right. community right. just did that. Right. 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 actually just did bus. High school starts later. And my kids get on the bus at 7.05 now. They're getting on 7.35. Yeah, Let's talk to this man. We tried to do that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so, successfully, good job. So, basically, we'll flip your bar, right? 
Yeah. 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 Right. 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 So, yeah. Right. Okay. Which is an ideal world where you would be, right? That's, that's yes. Good, right? Ideally, that is what yeah. we would want. Absolutely. Yes. So in theory, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you had someone that had, you know, you know, a, a center school or an early elementary and an older child, they possibly, if the older child is starting later, may even just leave them on campus instead of doing a second job, right? I mean, because you can't really do that with a True. first grader. Maybe yeah. it, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but if you have right a right middle right. or high schooler right. and yeah. a right. young No, that's, that's right. true, that's true. Right? Yeah. Like, it's possible, I mean, it's, sure. you never know, but it's possible that a family's only then making one trip instead of two. Right. Not two. I'm going to pull out an old cliche. I think it's really, really important that we not make perfect the enemy of the good in your life. I mean, we're talking about an enormous opportunity for our young members, and it's not going to be a perfect traffic situation all day long, but when you look at those charts, it's these little five-minute periods of a total amount of time, morning and afternoon. To me, it's so little compared to what we're offering potentially for our young kids. So, I mean, I just think that's a <coughs> So that point, I think, is the thing I thought of at one point of this is that was that same level of scrutiny done when the when the full high school project was going on? And if everyone might have, I I was not here, but well, yeah. So there's there's existing issues that happened from that project that we're seeing borne out today with traffic. I think we're doing a significantly much deeper due diligence on this round, which feels like a, a better sort of solution with that feasibility sort of caveat. But in both cases, the issue is there's really no place to buy a piece of land that's big enough sure. for the high school, middle school. I mean, yep. this is the other thing is that, you know, we kind of have the land that we have with whatever challenges exist. Or money. Mm -hmm. Or money. money. And the money that we have, sure. right. I mean, you know, that. So I think, again, I know it's a cliche, but we really have to be careful not to be the perfect I think that's so important. <clears throat> um, so question regarding bus routes. I know we had that kind of heat map, the GIS heat map, where the kids go to the three different neighborhood schools are located. Is has it been looked at, and would there be um, if all the kids go to one endpoint, right? Could there be more efficient bus routes for picking? Maybe right because. It's possible, but we don't Anything's we don't possible. want the children to go too far, so it might sure. take a couple extra buses or something. But sure, there are there are options. Like, can I just ask one thing? Uh, on the queues now. I'm sorry. The queues when they in the morning. We're going to triple the capacity of the new park queue and the renovated park. Those queues sometimes can go all the way down the school, all will start halfway down the street. If we triple them. I mean, you, you've been talking about cues you haven't thought of. But I think what they're saying is that's why instead of just going down Spooner, it'll turn onto the campus and go all the way oh, yeah. around the building, all the way to the field, and all the yeah. way back again. The queue is built within yeah. the yeah. site. So they can try to create space on yes. the queue. I don't see the queue going away to take that little off the street, right? <laughs> we'll take one, one thing I do want to add. Uh, um, Eastern is uh, part of the Safe Routes to Schools program in, uh, for the state. So one of the things to think about is to you know again promote walking and uh, you know traditional usage of the bus. I know the, the data doesn't show that parents want to do it, but you know there are a lot of other benefits to you know using alternate modes, you know, whether it's walking or taking public transportation to school. That also, as a side benefit, would help reduce the traffic. So we are not only really talking about new connections or new, you know, intersections and signage and things like that. You can actually reduce the demand by by not having parents come out uh, you know, to the school every single day morning. And after. So there are ways to do that, and the study will include some of those recommendations for your consideration. So well, you bring up a really good point because I think you have. Uh, more opportunities to add those different modes of transportation, like on a bicycle, a walking to Pontview, but the Senate School is already a difficult location, and Route 123, you're not going to have a child uh, walk on 123. 
So you almost really don't have any opportunities to mitigate that traffic on sensory, whereas the, the epoxy location have a lot more opportunities, whether you bring an access road from Lothrop Street or you do some other mitigation. But it seems like to me like you can really mitigate all these issues more so on the parking site. The center school is what it is for that situation. Okay, so I, I think we're all in agreement that we're going to take it two more weeks. At the next meeting, we're going to take, um, we'll have the final results of this. Um, not expect any fatal flaws to have emerged, um, but have that validated, <coughs> and then we can vote um, on a preferred design solution. That is now down to one of two choices. What is the next meeting date? Well, we need to decide that. Um, but oh, I guess we can do it now. I think there's a question in there. Oh, oh. I so have a question. Um, based on the walking situation, how important do you think it is to have that pedestrian walkway out to Sheridan? Because I can see that as a, a problem with people dropping off, picking up, and get a crossing that I have. You know, I, I, if, if that, is that important to have in your plan? That comment has come up a few times before, so we'll be looking at it pretty closely. Our analysis does not rely on that connection being used, so we're assuming that parents are going to do what they're doing today. If they do something different and put more students on the bus, that helps the traffic situation, but we are not assuming that the walkway between the school and Sheridan as, as one of the solutions at this stage. Thank you. So, we're, I'm just so two weeks out is the week of April eighth. Um, so, I know that we usually meet on Wednesday night, but I think Wednesday is the Lions Club also, dinner, it's the and it's a select, Wednesday is the Selections meeting. We have second Wednesday. We have meetings with National Council Regional Okay, um, so. Wednesday the 10th, I would say, is out. Um, we're meeting on a Tuesday now, right? Tonight, what's no, the meeting? Yes, yeah, it's Tuesday. 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 Yes, we're all be one of those that's the or, the two the and that's, the, what, and just that's what they should just. No, we're going to go over a lot of the same thing. Yeah. Like presenting a lot of the this community data, forum is the 11th. Oh, yeah. So that's we meet good. right before the community see. forum, which starts at 6 30. So we have to meet earlier, yeah. like at 5. It's the 11th. So I'm gonna need a. I need a, We need a form. So I cannot guarantee we need a at five thirty. Or that's five thirty. Yeah, five thirty. Is the whole day out or just the time? For me, it's the time. But I mean, five thirty makes it easier. I I may have my kids in tow. They can both. They can both. It's more than half. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we we could just make it a very quick meeting that we take. Half an hour to get the traffic updates and vote. That. And the other uh, little update on the cost for the central. Yes. <coughs> Five thirty on the eleventh. Five thirty on the eleventh. And I would suggest that we have that meeting at the high school because that's where the forum is. So we can maybe coordinate with Lynn. Yeah, I'll have to tell you exactly what room. Yeah. <coughs> tomorrow. Okay. How many people meet? <laughs> I think it's like eight. No, it's actually less than that. Okay. Good. Okay, so now do you want to go over the schedule and then we can do tours? Do you need to do this? The tours is also on our agenda tonight. Yes, it is. For uh, yeah, I mean, nothing's changed other than the next building committee meeting, which is the 11th, you know? Yeah. 30. Standing, standing with all these. Small, uh, but uh, still trending uh, slight, on budget, but slightly under uh, $268,000 versus a, a, a roughly $300,000 uh, 
at this point in time. So it's great. So I'm going to ask that I'm actually not going to put this presentation up yet. I'm going to wait until we have up until the traffic information is not in draft form. Um, we usually put things up on the on the website, but I think I want to wait until we're not looking at drafts anymore. But if you don't mind, just get me the this one. And I will let Bob's go over the doors. I don't think you slides. I didn't throw slides in there. They're scheduled, and I don't have them in front of me. I think we have a fair number of people signed up, so we consolidated them so that we have two trips north and two trips kind of south. Um, sorry, I don't have the dates. Were they full? The 12th. The 12th. The 12th at 9 a.m. Um, would be for service elementary school and then the Bancroft School in Andover. Uh, services in and then let's see on the 24th looks like uh, we have 10 a.m. Uh, Carver and then noon at uh, a little bit afternoon at uh, Jacobs so I think we've got seven, seven or so people signed up last I checked for each one plus there'll be Eight. architects OPM so we're probably talking about between 10 and 12 people so that's a good sign I think only one of them had one open spot. Yeah. It was eight. So they're all eight in one seven. That's great. Anything else in terms of all right. I have the same question to each one. On the tracks that will then take potential for the uh, central administration office to be on the campus as well. No, we look at that after we made a decision about that. Are we? How many vehicles are you? How many employees are sent to live then? 18. 18? Yeah. Okay. It's not a big scheme. We don't think that that would impact enough to no. prevent no. it. So we'll have to have a that we can drive to change the door offline. In terms of travel. Okay, so we must go to a lot of time. I think it's all time. Yeah, you correct. Yeah. Can I have a motion to adjourn? And second. Second. Carolyn, you should do it. All in favor? Thank you very much.